If you have your Bibles this morning, whether it's on your phone, your tablet, or the printed version, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We've been talking about emotions that if we allow them to linger in our life, they can become destructive. Toxic is the name of, of this series. Toxic emotions. And, you know, emotions in and of themselves are not bad. God gives us emotions. He gives us emotions to help us uh, to remember significant events. Sometimes there are joyful or tearful emotions. If, if it's a wedding or a birthday, the birth of a child, I remember when my kids were born, I cried like a baby. And those emotions come out to help you to, to remember and to treasure those things. Sometimes there's negative emotions that help us to learn from events and to grow from different events. God has emotions, and just about every one of the emotions that we've talked about, God has. We talked about God having anger and God having jealousy and, and things like that. So God even experiences emotion, and uh, there's nothing wrong with emotion unless we allow those emotions to linger in our life. And what we've been saying through this series is God gives us emotions not as, as, uh, as guides. They're not things that we're to live our life on, to make decisions based upon emotions, but they're there as gauges that when emotions linger or emotions begin to cause uh, things to happen in our life, that it is a gauge that something is wrong in our heart. We talked about anger, and the mentality behind anger is that you owe me something. There's been an injustice done to me, and you owe me, so I'm angry. You need to pay me back. We talked about guilt, where we felt like we didn't do enough, and so I owe you. So many of these emotions have, have a feeling of debt, a debt base. You owe me a debt. I owe you a debt. Uh, we talked about jealousy, <clears throat> where sometimes somebody else is blessed and you're not blessed, and so your feeling is God owes me. God, you did that for them. You owe me. Why are you treating them differently? Why are you favoring them? This morning, we're going to talk about something that I really kind of wrestled with, whether it was an emotion or not, but it, it definitely causes emotions to stir in our heart. Several years ago, there was a, a band for some of you younger people, uh, Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. Maybe you've never heard the group or the music, uh, but he sung a song called, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And you know, I find a lot of people in our world today that this could be their theme song. They're always discontent. They're never happy. They're always griping. They're always complaining about something. They always feel cheated. They have this sense of entitlement. They feel like they deserve something more. They've earned something more that they can't get enough, right? I can't get enough of this, or, or I'm not getting my share, or, 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 or I'm just never happy. People, I maybe run across people that are just miserable out there because they're just not getting what they feel they should be getting. And I think sometimes this is an emotion that might be best categorized as greed. And before you tune me out this morning and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm not greedy, I don't have anything, greed has nothing to do with money, all right? Let's read here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, a story of David, considered to be one of the greatest kings, if not the greatest king of Israel. And it says, I'm going to start in verse 2, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of his king's house, of the king's house, he was the king, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, <laughs> took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and then she returned to her house. David's on the top of the, the, the palace, and he looks down and he sees this woman bathing. I'm imagining that she didn't have a bathing suit on, but a birthday suit. And he said, I got to have that. He became greedy. And he sent some messengers, find out who that woman was. This reminds me a, a little bit about Samson, who saw a woman and said to his, his parents, Daddy, Mama, i got to have her. Go get her for me. And that's really what David said. I want that. I've got to have that. And this is really at the root of this emotion that we're going to talk about this morning. First of all, we need to understand that God gives us the desires of our heart. And this is a passage of Scripture that you'll find in Psalm chapter 37, verses 3 and 4. It says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Now you can read this two different ways. Delight yourself in the Lord 
and he will give you the desires of your heart. The first way you can read that is, is that whatever you desire, God will give to you. Delight yourself in the Lord, and whatever you desire, he will give to you. And I believe that, that that's probably uh, some truth to that, that God wants to bless you, that you as you worship him and delight yourself in him. But then another way that you can read it is if you delight yourself in the Lord, that the desires of your heart will be God-inspired, God-breathed. They will be placed there by God. And I like that too. In fact, I would prefer that, really. You know, most people would say, well, I want God to give me everything I want. No, I want everything that I desire to be God-inspired, to be God-breathed. Because if you got everything that you wanted, everything that you want would not be something that God wants you to have, would not always be good for you. Everything that we ask God for, sometimes we don't get it and we get mad at God. But have you ever considered that because God cares about you and loves you, he's not letting you have that? Did you ever give your kids everything they ever asked you for? No. Why? Because it's, it's not healthy. It's not good for them. You spoil them. You know, they, they, they would be uh, just a mess and a wreck if you, you didn't teach them discipline, if you didn't teach them certain principles in life. So God doesn't give us everything we want. But I loved this prayer to pray, God, I want the desires of my heart to be what you want for me, to be your desires. Either way, greed reveals a, a huge lack of relationship and trust in God because the principle of this scripture is conditional. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. I've heard people quote this verse before. They say, God will give me the desires of my heart. That's not what it says. We go off sometimes with, with just half a scripture, and that's dangerous. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. In other words, be satisfied with just God. Be delighted with just your relationship with God, spending time in his presence, talking to him, uh, worshiping him, praying to him, learning about him. Let God be the greatest thing in your life, the most desirable thing in your life, the most exciting thing in your life. The thing that delights you more than anything is your relationship with God. And then these two conditions will happen. You'll, you'll, you'll be blessed with an abundance and the desires of your heart will be godly desires and inspired by God. So this is what God wants us to have, a relationship with him that, that, that we delight ourselves in him. But greed delights itself in its desires, not in God's desires, but in its desires. You know, we all live in a body, the Bible calls it our flesh, and our flesh has desires. Our flesh has desires that are not godly desires. Uh, I was talking to somebody uh, this week about being in, in church this morning. They were just brutally honest with me about what they did last night that kept them up and why they, they weren't able to make it to church this morning. Why? Because they let their fleshly desires dictate what they did yesterday. And that kept them from being here this morning. See, we live in a flesh body, a flesh that wants to do things that are not God-inspired desires. And greed wants to satisfy those desires, the desires of our flesh. It wants as much as it can get from, from our flesh. And so just like all of these emotions are debt-based emotions, greed says, I owe me. Anger says, you owe me. Guilt says, I owe you. Jealousy says, God owes me. Greed says, I owe me. I owe me. I'm entitled. I need to indulge myself. I I've done good. I've earned this. I've, you know, I've done this. I've done that. You know, Lynn and I have been feverishly working the last three years to, to lose weight and to keep it off. And we'll sometimes go all week starving ourselves and, and on this strict diet. And then on the weekend, man, we go to Menchie's because I owe me. <laughs> I owe me a treat. I owe me something. Now, we haven't done Menchie's in three weeks. We're having Menchie withdrawals this so far uh, this weekend. But uh, we just, that's our treat. I owe, I owe me something. And that's just indulging what our flesh desires. Our flesh just loves sweets. It loves those kind of things. I had a guy in the, the church years ago, and this speaks to this sense of entitlement sometimes, that I deserve this, right? Uh, I had lost a hubcap on my car many years ago, and I was talking to a guy in the church, and because I, I looked him up, they, they were like $85, $89 for a hubcap for my car, for the, the one that would match the other three, the dealer uh, hubcap. Uh, what do you call that? Manufacturer's one. And uh, so I was talking to him about it. He says, well, I work at Chrysler. He says, I can get it for you from a, for a discount. He says, I think I can get that down to about $75. And, you know, I was looking at $89, 90 
And so I, I didn't know if there was tax or anything like that. So I gave him a hundred dollars. I said, here, go, okay, thank you. Get me a hubcap, right? So he comes back a couple few days later. I see him at church and he hands me the hubcap and I go, oh, James, thank you so much. I said, did I have any change? He said, no. He says, I stopped and bought myself dinner on the way home because I felt like I deserved it. And I'm like, dude, I could have bought it for $90. It cost me $100. But he had the mentality. He did me a good deed. He deserved it. He earned it. You know, that, that sense of entitlement. And I think sometimes we all have that mentality. Greed is a sneaky emotion. It's not something that any of us would like to admit because it's a very self-centered emotion. I don't know too many people that would stand up and say, I, I struggle with greed. But I'll tell you this morning, I struggle with greed sometimes. I want everything that I possibly can get in different ways and in different areas. And really what you say when you say that is God is not enough. God is not enough for me. See, that song we read, delight yourself in the Lord means God's enough. David wrote the, the most popular song, psalm of all. And he said, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I need. He's all I need. And that's the best translation, really, of that. He's all I need. Somebody, the King James says, I shall not want. But it's, he's all I need. God is all we need. And when we struggle with greed, we're saying, God, you're not doing enough. You're not giving me, I deserve more. And, and, and we go out and we crave things more than what God would, would have us to have. And greed always seems to hide behind some type of justification. You can explain it. You can justify it. I work so hard. I've sacrificed so much. I struggle so much. I deserve this. I've earned this. I'm entitled to this. I heard somebody say one time that when you start to justify is when you need to crucify. Amen? That's good. When you start to begin to justify indulging your flesh is when you need to begin to crucify your flesh. Why? Because greed, number three, is a manifestation of fear. Greed is the manifestation of fear. I'm not going to have enough. Somebody's going to have more than me. I'm not going to get enough. Fear that God can't or won't provide enough, so we take matters into our own hands. I'm going to help God just a little bit, right? I'm going to starve if I don't get my menchies, right? I mean, it's something that we, we begin to, to take things into our own hand. Why? Because greed is never satisfied. Greed is just not satisfied. Years ago, there was a singer named Jesse Dixon that sang a song that I absolutely loved and got excited about as a young believer. And it says, when I found the Lord, I was satisfied. When I made up in my mind to serve him, I was satisfied. Why? Because Jesus satisfies the desires of your heart. Hallelujah. He does not de uh, satisfy the desires of your flesh, though. That's what we have to understand. He will satisfy the desires of our heart. Amen. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10, it says this. This is the New Living Translation. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. I like that. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. You know, I'm a bit of a sports fan, and I look at some of these athletes, and back in the 70s, there was this thing called free agency that began to hit the sports world. It started pretty much with the New York Yankees signing people, George Steinbrenner uh, buying players from other teams because New York had all these extra dollars from the television uh, market that they have being so big. And they really bought championships many times. And so this concept began to spread all throughout sports. And you'll get athletes today, it's not uncommon, for somebody to sign a contract worth over $200 million. Some of these guys are making, you know, $20 million a year to play a sport, something that's fun, something they enjoy. And they'll justify it by, well, you know, my career will only last 15 years. Most of us would not make $20 million in our entire life or come close to that. So, you know, I don't care if you get injured, $20 million, how much is enough? How much is too much? You know, you begin to think about it. every time he swings a bat, he just made, you know, $5,000, you know, that type of stuff. It's just amazing. It boggles my mind. But some of that is greed. The player's mentality was, well, if the owners are getting rich off of me, I'm going to get rich too. I want my share. I'm entitled to this, right? I deserve this. And this is really 
at the heart of greed. A funny thing happens when you start talking about money. Most people start to get uncomfortable. Money is one of those things that people just don't want to talk about. Have you ever thought to yourself, don't mess with my money? I know I have. We can all be pretty territorial when it comes to money. How quickly we forget that God blessed us with the job that provides for our family. Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the sea and built it on the ocean depths. You see, everything we have is God's first. And our attitude towards giving, it shows whether we look at possessions as stewardship or as ownership. Just for the record, our money, it's a matter of stewardship, not ownership. Stewardship really means supervising or taking care of something. You like an organization or property? So when we place our money in the hands of God, He can cause it to grow, and that blesses us more. So if you're giving today, I'd like to remind you that you can give online at the web address below. This is something that really works well for my family. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for, for who you are, Lord, and we, just, we place our, our gifts and our trust in you, Lord. Father, we know that it's yours to begin with. And Lord, we just pray that you can cause us to grow and to uh, expand, Lord, and that you can expand your ministry, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you for about a, a few minutes. And, and really, this mentality about how much is enough speaks to this story of David in the Bible. David saw Bathsheba, and he says, I want her. Do you know at this point, David had seven wives? Most guys would say one's enough. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> guys, that's where you're supposed to say the amen. Give me a little help this morning. Back me up, man. I need, I need your support today. And, and most people, I believe he had several concubines, like about at least 15 that the Bible talks about. So it's not that he needed a woman in his life. How much is enough? So I want to talk about different kinds of greed. And, and in Luke chapter 12, in verse 15, the New Living Translation, these are, are, are the words of Jesus. He says, then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. So there's different kinds of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And a lot of people think that, you know, that saying that he who dies with the most toys wins, right? I've done a lot of funerals in my day. I know you've heard this, but I've never seen a U-Haul truck following behind a hearse. You can't take it with you. Amen. Greed happens anytime a God-given desire gets out of control. And God gives us the desires for things. First of all, let's talk about the first kind of greed, financial greed or greed for possessions, material things, the desire to prosper. And you know, that's okay. God wants to prosper you. Uh, John wrote these words in 3 John 2. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God wishes above all things that you prosper. That is a God-given desire. How many of you want to prosper in here? Amen? You want to be blessed, right? God gave you that desire. He wants you to be blessed. But you know, the word blessed at the very heart, the root of the word is to be happy. And money can't buy you happiness. And so when we get this, this desire for money gets out of control, this desire for possessions and material things gets out of control, you're not happy. There are millionaires all over this world. One I heard quoted one time, a very popular man that I'm sure most of you have heard of before. He had this huge financial empire, as many women as you could ever want. He said, I'd give it all up to find true happiness. His name was Hugh Hefner. Money and, and, and things don't give you happiness. And so understand, God gives you the desire to prosper, but when it gets out of control, then it becomes greed. Uh, uh, probably uh, uh, another word for greed that we use a lot is lust. The second kind of greed is sexual greed or lust. And, and I just touched on that. This is the desire for intimacy, the desire for, for a, a relationship, to be close with somebody. 
And, and sometimes, you know, this, this can happen with, with uh, God gives us desires to be close to people, friends, you know, things like that. It doesn't have to be in the confines of a man-woman relationship. But sometimes this desire to have a, a partner of the opposite sex can get out of control. This is what happened in David's life. Like I said, he already had seven wives. He obviously had a problem in this, this area of lust, this area uh, of sexual desire that he couldn't control himself. He says, I got a, he saw a, a woman without her clothes on. He said, I got to have it. Go get it for me. And I know a lot of people that struggle with this desire. And, and it's difficult sometimes because it comes into the marriage relationship. And, and uh, I've counseled couples, uh, you know, the wives, they, they struggle. They feel like, you know, I'm not enough to satisfy. And that's not it. The, 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 the man is, is truly in love with his wife. They have a great relationship. But there's a desire that's out of control. And there's a greed. There's a lust. God gives us that desire for intimacy. It's born in our heart. To, to want to be close to a member of the opposite sex. But God has boundaries with all of his desires. And so the boundary for this desire is in the confines of a marriage relationship between a man and a woman where they come together for, to share that physical intimacy. God created the body of a member of the opposite sex to satisfy that desire in your life, but in the boundaries and the confines of a marriage relationship. Amen. And I could go off on that all day, and I know that's something that we need to talk about more in the church. The third type of, a type of greed is the greed for power and control. And again, this is the desire for success. It's a little bit different than the desire for materialistic things. It's the desire to have excellence, to have ambition, to, to have a, a drive for success. And you know what? God wants us to be successful. God wants his people to succeed. He told us in the Bible, I want you to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. I want you to be blessed in the city and blessed in the field. I want you to, to always have more than enough. God has, has given us this desire. He wants his people to succeed. And that's why, as you look all throughout history, some of the most successful, famous people in the world are Jewish people. Why? Because that's part of his covenant and his desire with his people for them to succeed. But when that desire for success, that desire uh, uh, for for excellence, that ambition within you steps on other people climbing that ladder. You don't care how you get there. Now you've got a problem. Now it's out of control. When you begin to do things to, to become successful that compromises uh, what God wants in your life, now things have gotten out of control. And David compromised. He compromised. The people tried to tell him, isn't Bathsheba, isn't she Uriah? the Hittite's wife? Isn't she the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David said, I don't care. Bring her to me. See, he wanted control. He wanted power. He was already the king, but that wasn't enough for him. He already had control and power of the greatest nation in the universe at, at that time, but that wasn't enough for him. He wanted to use that power and that control to gain more. And this is when it gets out of control. The fourth type of greed that I want to talk about this morning, I've already touched on, is the desire for food, the desire to eat. And, you know, this is a greed that, that people struggle with. It's a greed that I've struggled with. You know, when, when I hear the, the words, all you can eat, those are some of my favorite words. <laughs> that's number one. Number two is buffet. You know, that's right up there. And I don't know about you, but I, I've struggled with this. I'm going to get my money's worth at this buffet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that I get everything that I've got coming to me. I paid for this buffet, right? Thank God I'm not a woman because if I had a purse, I'd fill it up at the buffet. <laughs> I'd take it home with me, right? You see the last piece of something sitting there and you see people hanging around. You, got, you grab that last piece because it's got to be yours and nobody else's. I've seen people, you know, there's, there's four people in line and four pieces of pizza left. And they'll take their plate and put three pieces on their plate. Walk in, they've got three people left in line, one piece of pizza. There's a greed involved in that, right? When they're cutting pieces of cake and you look, and which one's the biggest piece? i got to have the biggest piece. I've struggled with those things. I'm speaking to myself. I'm, I'm being transparent and confessing before you this morning. Those are things that I've struggled with. Not caring about anybody else. That's really at the heart of greed. i got to get mine. I deserve it. I'm entitled to it. And like I said, greed doesn't always take on the form that we think it does. 
I want to share with you some principles this morning, and, and I didn't write these in your outline because there's a lot of them. You might want to grab your pen and write some of these. How to guard against greed. Jesus told us that. He said, guard against all kinds of greed. And so I'm going to share a few things with you to, to guard against greed. Number one, be a giver. Be a giver. People that are not givers struggle with greed. I know you don't like to hear that this morning. But be a giver. Share things. Be a tipper. Don't fight for the last piece, the larger piece. Be a giver. The Bible says you're more blessed. And again, the word blessed means happy. You're more content. You're more satisfied if you give rather than receive. There's two types of people in this world. There's givers and there's takers. God wants you to be a giver. Takers are never satisfied. They're never content. They're never happy because they struggle with this emotion called greed. Be a giver. Can I say it again? Be a giver. Amen. That's how you guard against greed. Learn how to give. It's not easy. It's tough at first. Some of you, I, I love to hear your stories and your testimonies, how God keeps convicting you and you start to give more and more. And the testimony of, of, of how God has blessed you in your life, how you're more content, you're more happy, you're more satisfied because you've been giving more. God's been doing financial miracles in your life. See, miracles, when it comes to God giving to you and blessing you, it doesn't happen from you taking. That's not what the Bible teaches. It happens from you giving. That's the the the. the currency of heaven giving money away demonstrates faith and when you give faith and you give trust and you make sacrifices it opens the windows of heaven and god pours things out upon you that the bible says you won't have room enough to receive secondly how to guard against greed give with no expectations or strings attached you know when we take up the offering giving is important but don't give to receive because that's not giving by faith. You've just lost your, your blessing, really. Give with the right heart. When you do something for somebody, don't have strings attached to it. Don't have expectations of them. Don't expect to get something in return. Give with no expectations of return. Give with, with no feeling of entitlement. Or, or, or be, uh, you know, I, I, I've done this. I've, look at me. I've earned this. Right. I've earned a blessing. No, that's not the right heart. Number three, don't let money motivate your decisions. I've watched a lot of people where money is the number one motivation in their decisions. And it's ruined their life, really. They're not happy. I've watched people uproot their family and move somewhere completely across the country for just a, a dollar or two more an hour. And the family falls apart. They get divorced. They lose their kids. Because money was the motivating factor behind a decision. Money should never motivate the decisions of your life. Remember, these emotions are not guides. They're gauges. And when you're struggling with greed, don't let that, guide, that greed guide you. Let it motivate you that there's something wrong on the inside that I need to change. Number four, frequently count your blessings. And be thankful for what you have. Why? Because greed takes inventory of what we don't have. Greed takes inventory of what everybody else has that we deserve, that we should have. Greed takes inventory of what we're missing, what we lack, what we've earned, what we're entitled to, what we deserve. Count your blessings. Take time to thank God every day for what you have. Thank God for your spouse. Thank God for your, your family. Thank God for your house. Thank God for your church. I thank God for this church. What a blessing it is. I think it's hard to find a church that worships like you guys did this morning. I think it's hard to find a church that teaches the uncompromised Word of God. I think it's hard to find a church that, that, that is so uh, loving and accepting of people the way that our church can be. And I've watched people just, again, make money a motivating decision to go somewhere and pull out of an environment like this. And it affects their life spiritually, and they don't understand that. Number five, celebrate when someone else wins. We talked about this when it comes to jealousy as well. Celebrate when somebody else gets something that you feel like you deserve, that you earn, that you were entitled to. Let somebody else win once in a while. You know, part of being greedy is, is this competitive heart that, that we have sometimes. And you don't want to let anybody else win. You don't want anybody else to get in line ahead of you. You don't let anybody else cut in front of you in traffic. 
I, I can't handle that. I can't stand that. Or the guy that, you know, there's 500 cars in line because of construction, and, and there's this big blinking arrow for everybody to get over, and everybody gets over, but this one guy, man, he's got to fly up that lane all the way to the end and cut in front of 500 other people. And I repent every time I do it, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it's greed. I got to be the first in line. I got to have this. I got to have that. What am I on? Number six, learn how to say I have had enough. I've had enough. I've had to go to buffets sometimes and make one trip. And I'm going, you paid $10.95 for this buffet, Terry. You deserve more than one trip. You've earned more than one trip. You're entitled to more than one trip. But I'm stuffed, man. And I've had to say, Psh, I've had enough. I can't eat anymore. That's not easy for somebody that struggles with greed. But that's how to fight greed. I've already touched on number seven. Avoid all you can eat or trying to get your money's worth. Avoid free stuff, you know. What do you mean, Pastor? If you struggle with greed, I've seen people, oh, it's free, man. They just grab as much as, it's free, man. Just because it's free doesn't mean you got to take everything. That's greed. And finally, I was at number eight, I'm on never compromise to obtain more of anything. Never compromise to obtain more of anything. Probably the most important one of them all. Never compromise. Never cut corners. Never uh, sacrifice integrity just to get more of something. David compromised his values and his beliefs to have Bathsheba. And after he became intimate with her, she got pregnant. Look what this greed caused in his life. Now what are you going to do, David? You can't hide it. Her husband's been out on the battlefield for the last three months, or I don't know how many months. It's obviously not his child. What are you going to do, David? He called his commander. He says, take your eye and put him where the fighting is the hottest and put him on the front of the line. And his commander was like, well, but David, he'll die. Yeah, I understand that. Basically had Uriah killed. And justified it in his mind. Well, you know, he was going to probably die anyway. We've been losing the battle. It's been a tough fight. Because that's what greed does. It justifies things. Don't compromise. Don't seek things by any means. That's what greed does. It seeks possessions by any means. Jesus told a story in Luke chapter 12, in verse 16. It says, then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. He said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. No thought of giving anything away, helping other people. He had more than he could handle. No, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Then I'll have enough room to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and I'll say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you'll die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. I like that story. The landowner, he takes all the credit for his success here, right? I earned it. Let's build some bigger barns. Let's sit back. Let's eat, drink, and relax. I'll have enough to last me the rest of my life. You worked hard. You earned it. Again, no thought of, man, look at all my blessings. I've got a neighbor that's hurting that, that's got 20 kids, and maybe they need some help. I've got to, you know this food bank down the road that could use a donation. No. It, it just says there's only one man here in this story. It doesn't speak of a, a, a family, anything like that. I know what I'll do. I'll build bigger barns so I can have more. I can store more. I can keep it for myself. That's really at the root of greed is selfishness. And he had this concept in his mind that more stuff would give him more time. More stuff would make him happier. 
and it didn't happen. Eventually, everything we have will be owned by somebody else. Think about that for just a minute. Someday the house you live in will be owned by somebody else. The car you drive will be owned by somebody else. The money that you stored up and saved in your bank account will belong to somebody else. Someday we're all going to die. The Bible says it's appointed unto all of us once to die. And all that stuff that you stored in your bigger barn, this is what I call the bigger barn syndrome, right? Will belong to somebody else. Why not give it to them now? Why not share it now? Why not let them enjoy it now? Don't store it all up for yourself, for you don't know what the future holds, what tomorrow might bring. Again, the abundance of stuff is not the assurance of an abundance of time. There's a cost to greed, and for this man, it cost him his life. I admit one of the areas that God's really dealing with me that I struggle with, and not only is God dealing with me, but my, my wife is dealing with me. I know I share a lot of stories about my uh, love of sports and my uh, officiating that I, I do baseball here in the spring and volleyball in the fall, and I officiate basketball in, in the wintertime. And I love to get as many assignments as I can. I love to see that. Can't, I'd fill every day with an assignment to do a, a, a an officiating some type of sport or something. And not only that, like this uh, Friday, I umpired two baseball games over at Macomb Community College, and I was talking to the guy that I was working with, and he said, no, this, this tournament's been going on. It's uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He says, I'm umpiring 16 games in these four days, and I'm making over $1,000. And the inside of me is going, man, how do I get into that? How do I do that? I know the guy that's assigning. You should email him. You should text him. You should say, next time this comes up, think of me. I could do five games on Thursday and five on Friday. And I mean, that's how many games he was doing. And I'm thinking, wow, man. But at what cost? The cost of time with my family, the cost of the things I've got to do for the church, the cost of my my prayer time with God, the cost of stuff I got to get done at home, the cost of resting and relaxing. Amen? Amen. There's a price to pay for greed. And I'm greedy for these assignments, and God's dealing with me in that. You know, I'll go do a volleyball tournament, and they'll, they'll list, you know, this guy's got eight games, this guy's got eight matches, Frazier's got six, and I'm going, six? They got eight. How do I only get six? How do I get in on that eight match thing, you know? And I struggle with that. Am I the only one that struggles with stuff like that? Okay. I thought I would walked into the wrong church this morning. Not, you guys aren't perfect, are you? Okay. I just wanted to make sure. We all struggle with stuff like this. Here's the greed test. How would you feel if you lost it all? How would you feel if, if God said, give it all up? Are you attached to it? See, God doesn't mind you having stuff. He doesn't like when stuff has you. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? He was rich, right? Young, power, greedy. He says, Lord, I want to follow you. Jesus says, awesome, man. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. He said, what? Sell it all, man. Give it away. Come follow me. Because the only way to find life in me is to lose it. He said, what? <laughs> and the Bible says he walked away and didn't follow Jesus because what the Lord asked him was too hard for him to do. He failed the greed test. The Lord was testing him. And the Lord tests us, I believe, all the time. Why? Because I've said it a couple times this morning. Greed is not a financial issue. It's a heart issue. It's not a financial issue. It's a heart issue. You know, some of the most blessed people I know, prosperous people I know, they don't go out seeking it. It just comes to them. They're not the least bit greedy. They're faithful. Their heart's right. They're givers. They work hard, and God blesses them. But they don't go out pursuing the blessing. They pursue the blesser. If you learn one thing in life, don't pursue the blessing, pursue the blesser. Amen. That's the most important thing. 
Look at what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul writes these words. He says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Don't look out for your own interest only, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. You could flip that around. This is the attitude that Jesus Christ had. Not looking out for his own interest, always looking out for others. Amen? This is the attitude that God wants you to have. Greed is not the attitude of Christ. Last scripture I want to share with you this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Paul writes these words. He says, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. That's awesome. I love that. True godliness with contentment in and of itself is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. So greatness in God's kingdom is measured by contentment. Greatness in God's kingdom it's the last blank in your outline, is measured by contentment. Now let me say this. When I say contentment, I'm speaking of being content with what you have. There's a difference between that and being content with who you are. God always wants us to be growing. God always wants us to be a better us. God always wants us to, to, to desire more of Him, more wisdom, more revelation, more knowledge, more of His presence. See, there's some people that they're just a mess. Their character is a mess. They're physically a mess. Their relationships are a mess. And they're like, oh, God told me just to be content. No, no, no. There's a difference. Be content with what you have is what he says. Godliness with contentment. Those two things go together. Desire to be more godly. Don't ever be content with your spiritual level. Always be growing. Always be climbing higher. Always be desiring more of the presence of God because that's godliness. Amen. With contentment is great wealth, great gain. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads this morning. Did you get anything out of this? Yes. Amen. Father, we thank you for your words today, Lord. Your words are powerful. They cut to our heart. They bring life into areas that have died. They bring light into areas of our life that are dark. So we ask you this morning, Lord God, to help us to take these words and not just listen to them, Lord, but apply them in our life. For you've required us to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Lord, while heads are bowed and people are praying this morning, and if you're here in a, a normal church member, pray for people that might not know Christ today. And if you're here today and you say, Pastor, this was, this was different. This was something I haven't experienced. This was good. I, I felt God here today. I want to give you a chance to go deeper. Maybe you're here today and God's been a part of your life, but He's not been the center of your life. Maybe you've never invited Him to take control of your life. There's two words that the Bible uses that are kind of blind to us today. One means to give God control. We say, make Him your Lord. And the other is, is trusting God. Trusting the work that Jesus did on the cross to make you right with God, to qualify you to go to heaven. We call that making Him your Savior. If you're here today and you're, you're trusting in something, some people say, oh, if, if you live a good enough life, you'll go to heaven. Well, you're not trusting in the right thing. You're trusting in your own efforts and your own self. We trust in the work of Jesus on the cross. That makes Him our Savior. And until God has complete leadership of your life, He's not in control. We call that making Him our Lord. And if you're here today and you've never made Him the Lord and the Savior of your life, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Well, heads are bowed. These people are praying for you. This is not a church that's judgmental or condemning. We're not here to criticize or analyze you because we've all been right where you're at right now. We're cheering for you. You say, Pastor, I, I want to open my heart today and I want to invite God in. I want to make Him my Lord and my Savior today. That's you. Our heads are bowed. People are praying. 
I'm going to ask you to take a simple, quick step of faith. You can do this uh, uh, very quickly. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to expose you, point you out, embarrass you. This is between you and God. But it requires a step of faith. Press through your pride and your fear. And just put your hand up real quick and you can put it right back down. Pastor, that's me. I want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life today. Is there anybody like that at all? Pastor, that's me. Amen. I see hands today. Anybody else want to join these three courageous people? I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life today. I want to make him my Savior. Amen. I see hands all over the room today. We're going to all pray this prayer together, but this is for you that raised your hand right now. The words of this prayer are not significant unless the heart is behind it. And so I want you to pray this from the depth of your heart. Say this with me. Say, God. Come on, say it like you mean it. God, I need you. I come before you today admitting that you are not in control of my life. And I admit today that I've lived a life that has not pleased you. I ask you to forgive me. I confess my sin today. And I trust you with my life. I ask you today to become my Savior. Wash me from my sin. I receive the work of Jesus on the cross to qualify me to enter heaven. And I give my life to you today. I ask you to take control. I confess you as my Lord. And I invite you into my heart today to guide me and to lead me. Teach me your ways. I want to live for you from this day forward. And I ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah.